All right, is this, oh, it is on. Thank you guys for coming to our first ever uh, review of the literature of the uh, lecture book. You may not be familiar with that kind of phrase. It's simply a bibliography where we're going to look at what books have all these guys been reading. And uh, surprisingly, the first answer was uh, Harry Potter. That was what they were, no, that's not what they're reading. Uh, no, we're going to be going through, if you would like to know what was cited, we have a select bibliography, which means it's not the full bibliography. That was about eight or nine pages long. But a select bibliography is at the front here at each one of these steps. So when we're done here in 40 minutes, when we're done, you're welcome to come up and get a bibliography of what was cited in the lecture book. Um, and so that's what we're going to be discussing. So we're excited that you're either a curious student of the Bible. Uh, Dr. McClister was trying to sell a book last lecture. Uh, we're going to try to sell a lot of books. And what I mean by that on a very serious note is a lot of these books are available in the bookstore for sale. Uh, the cheapest one in there and the most cited Exodus commentary in this year's book uh, is by Nahum Sarna. Uh, this is uh, for the same price you can get on Amazon. You can get it in our bookstore right over here. So after you're done here, I'd, we'd love for you to go buy up all the books that they have uh, that were cited in this year's lecture book. Uh, this is a way for it to help you. If you're teaching Exodus at home, if you're preaching Exodus at home, whatever the case may be, uh, there's going to be some great resources these guys are going to talk about and that you can find in these sheets uh, to help put in your personal library. So thank you again uh, for coming, even if it was you just wanted to get a good seat for the chorus show that happens after this. So I'm going to start here. Uh, Nathan Warden will work our way across. So Nathan, you'll tell us uh, what's your connection to the college and uh, your credentials that uh, caused you to be up here. And then most importantly, what is the most profound or emotional experience you've had at the Florida College lectures that you've been to through the years? I think I'm, I think I'm currently having my most profound emotional <laughs> experience at the, the lectureship. Um, my connection to the college is pretty deep running. And when I say pretty deep running, I mean my maternal grandfather was in the class uh, the year they opened the doors in 1946. So I go back a little ways with the college. Uh, my parents met here and I met my wife here and my children are at the academy now. And I've been working here since uh, the spring of 03. I've been teaching in the Bible department for the last several years. And that's where I am now as uh, professor of biblical studies here at Florida College. You said credentials? I think that sounds good. Okay. Um, he asked me for my credentials. I meant like I think you said enough, but you can go ahead. Oh, no, I, I, I'll stop talking whenever you want. Uh, my credentials are uh, academic enough that I've been invited to be on a nerdy book discussion panel. So. Very good. All right, Luke. We went to school a bunch of years, so we'll call you Dr. Nathan. You've earned that at least. No, I'm Luke Chandler, and uh, my connection with the school, uh, my parents uh, met here back in the 60s. I was here as a student. I got my AA in 91, and um, my wife also went here, and our five children, the oldest is 16, so we're gearing up to have uh, that generation come here. I have some nephews and uh, so on who have come here so far, too. I, th I think I had a nephew in the last session who is not here in my session, so <laughs> go figure. Um, I, uh, I got my master's degree back in 2013 in uh, ancient and classical history. I adjuncted here a class a number of years ago in archaeology and the Bible, and I've done, uh, been involved in about 10 seasons of archaeological excavation over in, in Israel. Um, emotional moment. Uh, I, I heard this question just before we started, and I don't think I've ever had an emotional moment at lectures that stands out, but maybe this is it. I don't know. <laughs> I'll pass it off to David. David McClister. Uh, I was a student here from 1978 to 80 and then returned to teach Bible starting in 1996 and I've been a professor in the Bible department since that time and that's my connection to Florida College. As far as the most emotional moment of lectures, it's when a lecture speaker gets up and says, I'm not going to talk about what's in the book, I've got something I want to say to you people. <laughs> That, that always does it. So. Unfortunately, I, I know I did that to you, so I apologize for that, yeah. <laughs> All right, Steve. Um, I'm Steve Wolfgang. I currently I preach for the church in Downers Grove in suburban Chicago. I am FC class of 1968, and then went on to, I uh, did an MDiv at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary back before the takeover, so pre-Shriner, pre-Al Mohler. Uh, and then I did, uh, wherever I've preached, I've gone to school, never moved anywhere to go to school, but. Um, did master's degrees at uh, Butler and went to Emory, um, Vanderbilt, PhD, 
I've been taught at the University of Kentucky for near 20 years. Uh, so I guess that credentials me. And my most emotional memories of lectures is sitting down here on the second row. I met my wife here and we're married and sent our children. So this beautiful woman uh, in the gallery down here has provided uh, some of the good memories. Although I have provided one of David's memories also. I've gotten up and said, I'm not going to talk about her. Oh. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for being willing to take a risk on this uh, first attempt at this. And so let's start, first of all, the thing that uh, the title said is, what are our lecture, lecture speakers reading? And what I noticed as I sat through a lot of the lectures is a lot of Bible. And the first thing that I went through there and I looked at is what translations were they using? And it was surprisingly a three-way tie. We had 15 people essays in the book, and it was five, five, and not five for uh, the NASB, the ESV, in the New King James Version. And so what I was curious about is, is does this reflect, oh, we had a fan out there. Uh, does this reflect what you've all experienced with uh, brethren in your work across the country? And, and um, what do you think is the future with translations and favor among brethren? I was surprised to have that three-way tie. Anybody want to go first? I, I, it's generally my experience uh, from the perspective of teaching here and seeing what students are using. I, I think there's been a noticeable shift since when I was a student, lo these many years ago. Um, when I was a student, it was probably pretty well split between New American Standard and New King James, with a little bit more of an emphasis on the New American Standard, because that's what most of the professors were reading and really emphasizing. Um, that was before the ESV came out in 2001, and that kind of changed the landscape. Of, of what Christians were reading. It, it really shook things up. And it reminds me always of, of something Phil Roberts said um, in his essay on returning to the textual base of the King James Version, is that he believed that the New, American, uh, the New King James Version was an inferior translation to the Old King James Version in terms of the beauty of the language and the potential longevity of the translation itself. And the irony is that by trying to preserve the King James, it was ultimately going to eradicate it. That mm -hmm. uh, people would change the New King James, the Old King James would fall by the wayside, and then the New King James wouldn't be able to last the way the Old King James did. And I've kind of seen that happen in the classroom, where the, the, the New King James has been pretty well supplanted by the ESV, um, and, and some other translations as well. I'm seeing more NIVs and Christian Standard Bibles in the classroom. Um, but I, I see fewer and fewer New King James translations every year, and it just kind of reminds, every time I think of it, it reminds me of, of what he said in that essay. Which, by the way, um, to, to go back and give maybe a serious answer to the emotional thing, uh, one of the things we all talked about in some of our preliminary emails back and forth was the influence that Phil Roberts had on all of us. And probably one of the most emotional moments that we all experienced was the year that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and it was announced, and he was given the Friendly Youth Award, and we all kind of got to hear him speak that, you know, one last time about his beliefs of theologically undergirded education and those sorts of things. So there, there's a real answer to that question. Yeah. Now, there used to be then a... I don't know the, the, what the term was, but a recommended translation that the students had to buy back in the day, but I understand that's no longer the case. So, Dr. McClister, how do y'all handle that here? Yeah, uh, when I was a student here, everybody was required to purchase the ASV from 1901, which was a good translation, still is in many ways. It's very, it, it follows the original language and word order very closely, and so it can be difficult to read in English. Uh, but if you want something that kind of catches some of the the word order sound of the original, it, it does that. Um, it's, it's proven to be difficult to require a singular translation these days. Students come with Bibles. Bibles cost anywhere from 50 to uh, $200 a piece now. And so I just don't have the heart to make them go out and buy another Bible sometimes with all their other textbook expenses. Uh, what I tell students in my classes is that I want them to have a modern committee-based translation. So no paraphrases, no one person like a J.D. Phillips Bible, something done by a committee of scholars. And what I have in my classroom is exactly what you discovered, uh, lots of NASB, New King James, but more and more the ESV is the translation students are reading. All right, very good. All right, well, if you guys don't have anything else to say about translations, uh, let me move on to the next question, is that all right? 
the um, literature that was cited, um, which ones in this year's lecture book, the literature that was cited, were you familiar with, and why does it make it, what makes it a good resource? Well, I'm a little bit out of my element when it comes to literature on uh, Exodus, but my understanding is that John Curran's book uh, is written by somebody who's actually a practicing Egyptologist, which makes a lot of difference in commenting on the University of Chicago. Yes. Which is one of the centers for doing this. Yeah, I knew you were. Can I make an observation? Yes. Yep. Going back in back in the day, since I'm the old guy on here, even before David's time, when the ASV was required, nearly none of these commentaries that are on the bibliography list or in the book were available. I mean, we are you guys are lucky to be living in a time when there is a cornucopia of resources and now you know available on accordance and logos and so forth that make it so much easier to stack up 20 commentaries <laughs> instead of doing it on your desk and flipping through all of them. So um, I, I, a lot of the commentaries on here and in the book, if you look at, for example, Mark Roberts commended commentary list that some of us contributed to, or you go to bestcommentaries.com, uh, the, the, our speakers are hitting uh, all of the, the really good stuff, I think. I mean, I was impressed with, uh, with the list of that. I think it's a really solid list, and I think this has been a really solid lectureship. I mean, I, I, my hat's off. I don't have anything really critical to say about what's here. Now, you ask us to talk about what's not here, and I've got a few ideas about that, but I'll shut up. Yeah, we'll get, yeah, we, guys. Yeah, we'll get into what wasn't. I do want to say, since you mentioned John Curid specifically, and this bibliography, his commentary did not get cited, but his, I think, introduction to the Old Testament was what was cited. Uh, so do be aware, if you pick one of these up on your way out the door, John Curid introduction for the Old Testament is what's cited, but McClister was recommending his commentary on uh, the Exodus. He's okay. also got a monograph on Israel and Egypt. Yes, right. Okay. But uh, I wanted to second what Steve said, that uh, in the areas where I regularly do study, it has become kind of commonplace for authors to start their commentary by saying, I have not read everything that is available on this because with the internet and revolutionary uh, revolution in printing, there's just too much material out there. It's, it's a good problem to have. So. Yeah. I'll mention a couple things yeah. um, that I appreciated, but two resources I appreciated. One was uh, the book you mentioned earlier by Nathan Sarna. Uh, one thing that I think is valuable about his resource is that he's Jewish, and these were originally, you know, this is the Hebrew Bible we're talking about, and we tend to look at things, you know, from a, a very different perspective, you know, we're different culture, different background, we're separated by, you know, three, three and a half thousand years of space, and, you know, of time, and, and this massive space on the other side of the planet, and Sarna, of course, is not an ancient person, he's, he's around, but he's been around, but to have a resource that's not a typical, I guess, you know, a, to use it generically, a Christian resource. These books are originally written, you know, by and to God's people, you know, the, the Jews, the Hebrews. And to have that perspective uh, apart from our bubble and the Christian bubble, if you want to use that term, can be valuable because we're originalists and we want to get the original intent, the original perspectives, original understandings, and not that any Jew automatically has that, but to have that broader perspective. And another one on here, um, I didn't see it originally, but I saw it when you passed this out, is um, Richard Alter. And he's also Jewish, but he's a secular Jew. And so um, uh, Sarna is a religious Jew, as I understand it. And so, but with that, a lot of his perspectives are sh in shaded or influenced probably by traditions, I think, that you know, the rabbis have written for hundreds of years or longer. And to have a secular Jew, it's just a fresh set of eyes, a fresh perspective, and it make, takes out some of the biases that come with someone who's raised with it in the same way. And sometimes fresh eyes, even if not everything is accurate or we would agree with, they provide freshness that really round out our perspective. I mean, Paul the Apostle knew you know, Greek poets very well, and he could use them in his sermon to Athens in Acts chapter 17. You know, they obviously talked about paganism, but he found value in those things and different perspectives. And I think having some of those other perspectives, other backgrounds in the bibliography is useful. Yeah. I'll add in one thing about Alter. Um, Alter has done an entire translation of the Old Testament, what he would just call the Bible, but uh, we call it the Old Testament. 
And his translations, it's, it's one of the sorts of things David says we don't recommend in class, which is a single author translation. Uh, and there's really good reason to use a committee-based translation. You've got multiple scholars from multiple different denominational persuasions kind of balancing each other out, so you're not getting the party line of any one group of people pretty well. But it also kind of binds the translation so that you're not going to get anything different from what you've always heard. I mean, every now and then something like that will slip through, but if there's something that it, it could mean this that you've always heard your whole life, or it could mean this other thing that sounds radically different, you might not ever know that it could mean that other thing because the committee won't let them put it in. Uh, you know, an iconoclastic single translation, uh, single author translation will do whatever it wants to do, which is a dangerous thing, but it can be an interesting thing too. And Alter's translations also include pretty extensive, for translation, pretty extensive notes and commentary along the way. And so you'll get some of that Jewish perspective, secular Jewish perspective, that Jewish perspective uh, on these texts. And I've, I've found his translations um, to be alternately insightful and infuriating, although not as much as Walter Brueggemann is alternately insightful and infuriating. Um, but uh, also his comments are, are helpful uh, very often. Yeah, for those of you in the audience, if you pick up one of these bibliographies, the Richard Alter is listed in the third section as a reference work, and so is the John Curid one that McCluster mentioned, Ancient Egypt and the Old Testament. So if you're looking for where those are, that's those. One last thing yeah. on that. Uh, if you're looking for it, it's Robert, Robert Alter, yeah. not Richard. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, all right, the other two, com after Nahum Sarna, the two commentaries cited the most were Stuart and Hamilton. Um, so why do you think these guys were, I see these guys cited a lot by others, not just in this particular lecture book. What do you think of the reasons those guys were cited? What can you say about those? Very quickly, Hamilton is not cited because he's our department chair in the Bible. That's department. right. It's a different Hamilton. It's <laughs> right. Victor Hamilton, so just to clarify that more. Yeah. Uh, Victor Hamilton is his name. Well, Hamilton has what's called a narrative approach to uh, comment, commenting. Rather than going verse by verse, he tends to comment on how the Bible is telling a story and the plot development and the, the climax and the resolution, all the things you'd look for in a story, which is, I think, a tremendously helpful way of reading Bible stories. And his, uh, his book provides that kind of perspective. We're seeing more and more commentaries written from that perspective. But again, you know, not all commentaries are the same, and they're not all written for the same purpose. So we probably have a panel discussion on that sometime. Just what commentaries do. <clears throat> yeah. I might add one thing, just kind of pragmatically, about why Hamilton is used a lot is because his Genesis commentary is phenomenal. And I know a lot of people. The reason they go buy a book is because they read something else by that author, and it was incredible. And Hamilton's Genesis is a two-volume Genesis commentary in the New International Commentary in the Old Testament series, um, which is, you know, it, it's hard to pin down, if you had to recommend just one really good Genesis commentary, it's hard to pin down which one to go with, but that one is definitely in the list of, of those to recommend. It's been out for a very long time, so people that have done a lot of work in Genesis know Victor Hamilton from that, and then if they see that he's written an Exodus commentary as well, they're going to be kind of inclined to go get that one. So there may be just some some pragmatism of, I know this guy, and he's good, that kind of leads to, to reading that book. Yeah, and he's listed in the Genesis section of this uh, select bibliography. Since you mentioned how much he's loved for that, and Steve, you mentioned this earlier, bestcommentaries.com, uh, Victor Hamilton's Genesis is number two on, on that list. Uh, do any of the rest of you guys use bestcommentaries.com, and, and what do you think about that? And Steve, if you want to give them some time to think, what do you think about best commentaries? You referenced it. Well, it's like any resource. It's evangelical-oriented for the most part, although there are a lot of you know, more liberal commentaries on there. Um, I often look at it if I just want to, you know, which one of these 20 commentaries that came with my Logos package uh, or that I've upgraded to when, you know, you buy these packages that are on sale and you get a lot of things that you know you want, but you get a lot of things that you... I'll talk about one of those in a moment if I get a chance. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, I, I like to know what, uh, what do other, that's the reason for this panel, what do other people think are good resources? I mean, why should I waste my time wading through, you know, number 57? Yeah. And I could be looking at things that other people think are, are better commentaries, which is not to say that number 57 might not also be very good. 
Yeah. And we've got a whole range of commentaries. Right. Sometimes they're low on that list because they're new, yeah. and so it takes a while for them to rise. Yeah. Anybody else want to? Yeah. My, my experience with their rankings is sometimes I think they're for the the biblical books that I know well and I know the literature well. I look at their rankings and sometimes I think, man, that's dead on. That's exactly how I would order them. And sometimes I think, what on earth are you people thinking? What, are you out of your minds? Um, and so my, my own use of Best Commentary, I do use bestcommentaries.com. My use is primarily less for the rankings and more to find out what's there that I don't know about. Right. Um, and I have found some real gems that way. And it's typically what I was just saying. I found that Howard Marshall wrote a Philippians commentary in some obscure little series I never heard of in my life. But he is a top-end New Testament scholar, so I wanted to see what he had to say about it. Um, and it's a pretty thin volume, pretty popular level commentary. It might be exactly what someone's looking for, but if you just say, what are the main Philippians commentaries, you'd have no idea that existed. And yeah. so I will use it to kind of get an exhaustive list of what's out there, see what I already have, see what else is out there that I would have never discovered and then kind of go from there as I'm, you know, building a bibliography for whatever it is that I'm studying at the moment. Right, yeah. All right, how about this one? Uh, what resource was cited that was new to you and why is it that you want to read it? I think this is one I was supposed to talk about specifically because of some of our, our pre-discussions, so I'll, I should probably start rather than letting there be an awkward silence. Um, <laughs> I mentioned, as we were talking through some of these things, um, the, the Christopher Wright uh, story of God biblical commentary that pretty recently come out. I don't remember the date on it. Um, I'll let you look that up, Culture, while I talk. Um, it, relatively recent. I knew it was coming out. I don't know if I knew that it was out already or not, but I have not looked at it at all. And I said that one struck me as interesting because of the same thing I've been talking about the last two questions. I know Christopher Wright from other things that he's written. And so far, everything that he's written that I've read has been worth reading. And so when I see his name on something new, I want to get that too and see if it's worth reading. And Christopher Wright is one of those guys. There have been several of these that you've probably had some experience with uh, on your own over the years. Uh, I think of Derek Kidner in the Old Testament, who was cited a few times today. I think of John Stott in the New Testament, who are these, these authors that they tend to write less academic uh, academically, although they have some pretty good credentials behind them, but they write in brevity, they write with a voice to the populace uh, rather than to the scholar, and they're accessible. Derek Kidner, I have said many times in my life that Derek Kidner can say more and fewer words than anyone I have ever read in my life. Um, and John Stott's got a little bit of that too on the New Testament side, um, although he can be a little bit more verbose than Kidner. Christopher Wright is one of those kinds of authors. When he writes, you don't sit there scratching your head saying, I don't understand every fourth word. I need to go get my dictionary. Um, he's a real bona fide scholar. He knows his stuff backward and forward, but anybody can pick up one of his books and benefit from it, whether you're a brand new Christian or whether you have multiple high-level academic degrees, you're still going to benefit from reading it. And it takes a special kind of author to write in such a way that benefits that broad of a range uh, of an audience. And Wright's got it, at least in my experience. So, like I said, anything that he's written, I'm gonna at least give it a chance. Yeah, that citation was, uh, it's a 2021 book, and uh, Mark Hines had it in his, so, and, that, and that's in the bibliography. It's one of those that's too new, so it doesn't show up on best commentaries yet, so. All right, anybody else have any some that stood out to them? I remember you I, had one. Well, I put You're, a New Testament book on there, Matthew Bates' Salvation by Allegiance Alone. It's in John Weaver's uh, lecture. Right. I had just got to one and started to read it when your list came, of the original list, a few months ago. And I haven't gotten much farther in it since then because I've been working on other things. But I think John's summary, he's got a, a two, three sentence summary and a footnote that I think pretty well captures uh, how pistis is faith is used in, in the New Testament, and uh, I, I'm saying more than that would take us down a rabbit trail, but I, I put a New Testament book in my response to it that I think is, is pretty good. Anybody else read that or looked at that? I think it's, it's worth tackling. And I can't uh, I know it's in here uh, somewhere, but it's not jumping off the page of it right now. But yeah, so in Weaver's on Bates. Yeah, Matthew Bates, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. So okay. A pretty radically, I think, better in understanding of, of faith alone. 
Okay. What does it mean to have faith? Basically? Okay. All right. What about this one then? What writings did you expect to see that, uh, cited that weren't? And why is that, what, why is that information valuable and you wish it was in there? Mr. McClister, I know you had a few of these. Well, look, at my, look at my notes and see what I told you. <laughs> can, I, can I go? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go, yeah. Um, well, I, Green and Gus's uh, book on laws was not here that I kind of expected. And you've already mentioned Christopher J. H. Wright, who has this whole series, Knowing God, Knowing, but knowing Jesus Christ, knowing the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, those are worth reading. But can, can I take two yeah. minutes and talk about a couple of other things that are That's not fine. That, yes, that, that yeah. I kind of expected to see? Uh, among our institutional brethren, um, uh, Edmund Gallagher, uh, he's kind of a Jared Salt sidekick, and I think Will Dill, he's a Hebrew Union PhD, teaches at Heritage. I, I think his, his little introductory book to Exodus is well informed, if not overly technical, uh, but it is very informative. And so Edmund Gallagher, uh, I think the title is just Exodus, and there's a, a subtitle. Um, another of our institutional brothers, uh, Harold Schenck, uh, has a book uh, in the College Press series, um, The Heartbeat of God. It's not altogether about Exodus, but he's got a really good chapter in there on, uh, on Exodus 34, 6, and 7, which I think is the critical text. I mean, I've said this to you in email, and um, our plane was, was late for a many nights, so we were doing Ben Hall by, by live stream, and he starts with Exodus 34, 6, and I'm going, yes! So, and several other people, have, several other speakers have mentioned that. But it, it, I mean, it's quoted all over the Psalms and the prophets and so forth. And in fact, Moses quotes it back to God in Numbers, 20, uh, Numbers 14. He says, you know, God, this is what you said you were going to do, so please, 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 would you forgive these wayward people because you are a God of kindness and mercy and chesed and, and so forth and so on. So I, I think that's a critically important concept that gets a whole uh, chapter in Shank's book. But the, the third thing... Well, say, say the, real quick, say those two authors again, I'll bring you back yes, to your third Edmund thing. Edmund Gallagher, G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R, okay. okay. um, and Harold Shank, okay. S-H-A-N-K, was uh, formerly president at Ohio Valley and then was at Oklahoma. And anyway, what I th would, thought I was going to see more of and would like to see more of is um, what about the, the, the women? In Exodus, and I know we have a women's track, but they're not in the book, and we don't get a bibliography. And so, I would like to know what are our sisters reading, what inspires them, what excites them, um, spiritually speaking. What, uh, you know, who are they reading? Because, I mean, in a book that starts with these are the names, once you get past the original register that takes us back to Genesis, who gets named? It's the midwife, Shifra and Pure. I mean, who's not named as the Pharaoh? <laughs> I mean, how many discussions would that solve if we knew who the, who the Pharaoh right, the Exodus right. was? But uh, you get the names of the midwives. And without the midwives, there's no Moses, there's no Aaron, there's no children of Israel, there's no Red Sea crossing, there's no covenant, there's no tabernacle. I mean, you can argue that God would have raised up another way to, to accomplish his purpose, which I think is true, but that's how, that's how he did do it. And uh, so I, I think that's just really important for us to consider, and not just that. that part of the problem is that um, some of these books that I, that I have looked at that uh, take a feminist perspective, frankly, uh, one of which I'm loath to, uh, I'll mention it if you make me, but it's, it's a feminist liberation theology kind of thing, but uh, so you really have to chew the meat and spit out the bones, but a lot of commentaries, you have to do that with anyway. It raises this critical issue in the very first chapter of what do you do? What do these women do when your government tells you to commit genocide? Go drown these babies in the Nile. Do you ignore that? Do you defy? Do you lie about it? What, what, do you, what, what does God want you to do in a circumstance, in a situation like that? And are there differences um, between living under an economic democracy and, and an autocratic monarchy, uh, like you find with the, with the pharaohs? I, I mean, I think that uh, the person I was going to, I'll go ahead and mention it, Kelly Nakandahe, who's not American, but married to, uh, her husband's from Burundi. And so, uh, as with anybody who's even ever visited a third world country, that gives you a whole different perspective, and she's asking a lot of different questions, highly speculative, um, 
the, the title of it is defiant. I see, yeah. And the, the idea is well, these, these women did God's will by defying what Pharaoh told them to do. So I just throw, I mean, maybe that's controversial or maybe not, I don't know, but that never stopped me before. So well, yeah, no, lay, that, I, lay that on the table and let it be, okay? I think you actually, I'm glad you spoke up about the, I knew there was the academic, a lot of, feminist commentaries that we could be going, but you mentioned something else in passing is that there's been, just like there's been an explosion in evangelical commentaries, an explosion in women's literature for ladies' Bible studies. And it would be interesting to know what is going on out in that world, who's reading that, what are they reading, because my hunch is none of us here are, and that's, that is an interesting question. I'm glad you raised it. Luke? While well, you're mentioning on a different subject, but uh, Steve was mentioning some other resources uh, on that. And there's one that I've become aware of recently, and uh, it's basically, it's by Austin Searles, S-U-R-L-S. It's on the question of uh, the divine name. And it goes through Exodus 34, but goes back to Exodus 3, the burning bush when God introduces himself to Moses. But Austin Searles basically published his dissertation, and you can get on Amazon, uh, maybe through the bookstore too, who knows. But I read a 10-page summary, which uh, was very good. And I think it'd be a great resource for future use. Again, it's new, but it's about the, it's called Making Sense of the Divine Name in Exodus. That's the title, Making Sense of the Divine Name in Exodus by Austin Sorrells. It basically goes through Exodus 3 and uh, resolves, some, talks about, uh, I think, in Exodus 6, but connects with all it. Basically, God introduces himself. It's not really introducing his name so much as a setup for people coming to know him later in the book and know him through his works. Anyway, it's a very interesting resource. Are you familiar with it? Oh, okay. okay anyway, that's one that would be good for future work in Exodus, I think. I just want to say one thing to piggyback off of what Steve was talking about, and I had no intention of saying this or even knew that it was going to be on the radar to talk about, so I haven't thought it through very well, and I'm going to try really hard not to paint with a broad brush, and I would desperately urge you to hear this as charitably as you possibly can. In asking the question of what our women are reading, I know that there is at least a stereotype, because I've heard it from multiple women in multiple places, that ladies' Bible studies can be very fluffy and not terribly helpful. I've never been to one, so I can't say anything. <laughs> That's what has been reported to me by women, so I, I'll say that. I think that should not be the case. Amen. I think our women should be reading deeply and studying deeply and thinking critically and presenting as top-notch of material as they possibly can, not just catering to how does this make you feel, which, again, I don't know what's happening everywhere across America or the world, and so understand I'm not trying to indict anyone in here in particular. Um, just commenting on what seems to be what I have heard very frequently and I mean you know whether that's true where you are or not but if that is true I think I think our women obviously have the ability to step it up a notch if that's what's happening and we should we should urge that to happen and if you're a ladies Bible class teacher then you know make sure you're doing that if you're an elder that is overseeing a ladies Bible class encourage them if, if they're not um, doing that kind of research and study and thinking. Here, here. Uh, and I'll join with you in urging it, because my, my limited experience has been some of my deepest students in the Bible classes and the churches I've taught have been the women who are wanting the meatier material. So yeah, if you are a ladies Bible class, you don't be afraid of the meat. Uh, you don't have to, and I, I'm, worried, I'm like you, I'm nervous about the way this could come out, but I don't want you to feel like you have to settle for something that you might feel is fluffy. Go ahead and challenge yourself, and your ladies may appreciate it. And, and I will say also, I've, I've known a few places where that's not the case. Yeah. And what I consistently hear from the women who go to the, those lecture conferences or ladies' days or just in the classes of the women who are teaching like that is, this is so refreshing, this is so incredible, why can't we study like this all the time? They want it. They want yeah. to hear that kind of teaching. Well, don't blame Nathan. I, I introduced it, so I'll take the blame. I'm old enough, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other resources you expected to see that uh, were not on the select bibliographies that weren't cited? Uh, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, part of the IBP Dictionary set, is a tremendous resource. Yeah. If you're not familiar with that. Uh, the late Phil Roberts actually wrote a few of the entries in that dictionary, but and just in terms of understanding how images and types and symbols get used in the Bible, there's really not another reference work like that one. 
And there's a really good article on Exodus and Second Exodus in that Bible. Now, I hadn't checked, but I thought I saw that was getting an update edition, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. So probably is. D- probably is. So if, um, don't know if the update has come out yet, but if it does come out, you want to be mindful. Of, Phil was in this older one, right? Okay. Any other resources? Well, let me ask a hard question to end on, if that's okay. You have yeah, some, go well, ahead. I wanted to say a word, as I said in the email, about older commentaries. Yeah. Uh, I expected at Florida College to see more citations of things like Kyle and Dalich or some of the older ones. And Nathan can tell this story better than I can. I, I emailed him because he related something a few years ago where he found something, in, I think, in Kyle and Dalich that had to do with an evidentiary, an apologetic um, argument that none of the evangelical commentaries had picked up on. But it, So why are not all these guys trumpeting from the rooftops an, an answer, a credible answer that's been out there for 150 years or longer. So Nathan, do you want to Yeah, that, that was that? specifically, it was a journal article that I stumbled across about the identity of Darius the Mede, the character in the book of Daniel who throws Daniel in the lion's den. And that there's no record of this person outside the book of Daniel, which you know, makes skeptics lose their minds and tell us the Bible's garbage, um, which is a terrible argument. But be that as it may, um, this article was unearthing this new Darius that has, you know, that we have evidence of. Um, and in the process, he indicates that there are a couple of really old commentaries that mention this, uh, the evidence of this person, um, and one of them was Kylan Delich. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it's, these modern commentaries, they haven't not read Kylan Delich. I mean, nobody that studies the Old Testament seriously skips at least perusing that, and yet none of it's been reproduced. And if it's because they don't think it's good evidence, they're not even acknowledging it saying, you know, we think it's bad evidence. They're just ignoring it completely as if there's nothing there to even think about. It reminds me, I've got a friend uh, up at Western Michigan University. He's in the philosophy department there. His name's Tim McGrew. He does a lot of apologetics works. And he's got a website called the Library of Historical Apologetics. I think it's kind of going through an, uh, an overhaul right now. But it, what it has on it when it's in its full form is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of public domain PDFs of apologetics works. And what I've heard him say before is a lot of the kinds of skeptical arguments that you're hearing from people like Bart Ehrman were answered in the 1800s and answered thoroughly and convincingly in the 1800s. And the shame is that we've forgotten the answers. Uh, Tim and his wife Lydia were behind kind of resurrecting an evidential apolog- uh, our argument for the the historicity of the gospel is called Undesigned Coincidences. She wrote an incredible book uh, on that. And they, they've done a lot with the works of people like Paley. Um, I, I think they're Anglican. Uh, I've heard him cite both J.W. McGarvey and Alexander Campbell at different times because he knows the old sources backward and forward. Um, and what he finds consistently is this stuff is worth reading. So do not neglect the old commentaries. Uh, McGarvey, Lard, I mean, not, not specifically on Exodus, but uh, yeah, that's enough. My, my pushback to that would be that I got to ask this question. McClister brought this up earlier. There's so much stuff out there. How do you know which old ones to skip or not to skip? If it's still being printed 300 years after it was published, <laughs> there's probably a good reason it's still being printed. I mean, I, I say this about hymns all the time. We always talk about how terrible all these new hymns are. Um, and maybe that's what you think, maybe, maybe you don't. All the old hymns are good, all the new hymns are bad. Well, the biggest difference between the old hymns and the new hymns is the new hymns haven't had 300 years for the garbage to be weeded out yet. Yeah. There's a lot of really good new hymns being written. The, the, the problem is that everything that was the, the terrible stuff in the 1800s, no one's singing it anymore because it was terrible. It, there's a natural process. I, I won't call it natural selection or anything, but there's this natural... <laughs> This natural process that happens with hymns where if they're not any good, you stop singing them. And if a not good hymn was written five years ago, there just hasn't been time for that yet. And the same thing is true with with good resources. If something is being published hundreds of years later, usually, usually it's because it's worth reading still. We need a panel on hymns. Hey, y'all are going to... I think y'all had something like that recently, didn't you? All right. You mentioned... um, not neglecting the old resources, and I agree, and we had some discussion on this in the pre-discussion, the pre-emails, but um, one thing I also put in there is to not neglect some of the new stuff coming out, and especially 
a lot of the information from the archaeological and anthropological world. Yeah. Because when K&D was written, it was the 1860s, I believe. You know, it, no one knew anything about Egyptology compared to even 50 years ago and much more today. And um, a book like Exodus is so context heavy, you know, that culture, that time period. If we don't understand that, then we miss a lot of the original perspective, the original aims. And there's a lot of work being done in just the past years. And if we don't look for the new things coming out and stay current, uh, we'll fall behind and miss some, perhaps some key understandings as well. Yeah, that's, I think that's a good, good answer too. Well, we're uh, out of time. Anybody have any final thoughts? Want to be the uh, last word on resources in Exodus from this year? I would just say that when it comes to picking resources, what resources am I going to use? I, I personally put a lot of thought into what I will and will not read. I, I, I read reviews. I, I scan articles because um, it, it takes a lot of work to figure out what the good stuff is. And you can't just you know, pick a commentary and expect it to be useful. You, you have to, it takes a little longer. Yeah. I'd add to that, that I, I tend to try to, anytime I'm studying something new, and once I get to that commentary stage, which, I mean, maybe another discussion for another day is the value of commentaries, why they should be read and all of that. But when I get to that stage, I try to, as much as possible, at least read at least three. And they'll be at different levels of writing. Some are more introductory, some are more heavily academic. I try to read them from different perspectives. I'll get your kind of standard evangelical, I'll get a critical commentary that I'm gonna disagree with constantly, and then I'll, I'll find something else. Basically, because it helps me pit them against each other. And if they all disagree with each other, that forces my mind into this critical thinking position where I have to weigh the right. arguments that each of them are making which is its own good exercise for me, but it also makes sure I'm never going to be led just down the path of a single person's thinking. And if we, o I'll say this, if we only read things by people that we agree with, we're never going to go grow beyond where we currently are. Amen. You have to force yourself to think beyond how you already think. Right. Can I, can I say thank you for organizing this? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you, put me on this program because you knew I was in the, the first issue of the current series back in 1974. <laughs> I, I was the guy that put the article in with 61 footnotes and bibliography and 20 pages. So I'm, maybe I'm guilty, but I wish somebody had done this th that year and through the years. I think uh, it's a really good well, idea. Well, ho hopefully it can start. So I would encourage you guys, to, uh, two things you can do if you want to have this continue, make sure you tell the people in charge of this lectureship, if you want this stuff to continue and, uh, and go buy a bunch of books, I really know that that would also help as well, I'm sure. So thank you guys for giving us your time and sharing with us your information that you know and hope to uh, do this again in the future. Thank you.